Let's get to work. I've given myself a little bit more room here today. Today is Palm Sunday. We realize that. And you'll see, I think that fits in very nicely with today's message. The, the topic today, of course, is holiness. And the, the title is Holiness is Hard. I want to begin with a question that you may, well, you might not like this question. And you may not like even contemplating the, the answer to it. But I want to ask you this question. How often do you think it's actually God's will for us to suffer? How often is it actually God's will for us to suffer? I don't know how well you can see this picture. It's got kind of an anomaly in it because it's got the, uh, uh, the Pantheon behind it, which is in Athens, but it, I think is a depiction of the Roman Colosseum. But what's pictured in this it, here is an authentic reproduction of what happened to first and second and third century Christians, and that is they were used for sport in the arena. They were given to, to battle the lions and, and, and other wild animals. But also, if you look closely at the picture, you'll see the, the, the stakes lighting the, lighting the area. That's what, what they would do is they would crucify enough Christians to put up light poles, basically, because they would crucify them and set them on fire, and that's how they would light the arena so that then they could feed the rest of the Christians to the lions and things like that. Christians historically have always endured persecution. In our country, in our culture, it is so, it's so rare and so extreme for us. In fact, I would say it's absolutely non-existent, certainly when compared to what our brothers and sisters around the world today and historically have gone through. And so maybe the question seems strange to you. How often is it actually God's will that we suffer? But I want you to notice that the reason why I asked how often, I originally was thinking, do you think it's ever God's will for you to suffer? But that's sort of a, a dead giveaway. If you've ever studied how to take a test, they tell you to look for certain words like ever, always, things like that. Because I'm sure we would all agree, if we have any familiarity with the Bible and you know, life as human beings, I'm sure we would all agree that at least once in a while or from time to time, it's actually God's will for some Christians to suffer. But as we read the scripture, I want you to see that, that it's not just a once in a while thing. I want you to go in your Bibles. Let's start. Hold First Peter. We'll get there in a second. I want you to go back to James. My wife read this passage last week. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers. What do you consider pure joy? There are a lot of things I consider pure joy, and they usually involve chocolate. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work. Yeah, how many of us wish we were more patient? Don't we, all, don't we all say, man, I need to be more patient? You know the only way to, to be more patient is to have more trials? If you don't have anything to endure, you can't endure. It's, it's really as simple as that. But it says here that, that perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The good news in this verse is that God wants us to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Doesn't that sound appealing? I want to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Okay, here, the, the way to, to have that is to endure difficulty. I want you to consider a continuum. What is God's will for us? We all again recognize, and this is a, a, an instance where using the word all is, is appropriate, life's not always fair. Every life has its problems. Some people have more problems than others. But where would you say on this continuum be, between a, a very easy life and a very difficult life, where would you say is God's will for you? Dare I say most of us at least hope that it's on the easy end of the spectrum. We're willing to take a little bit of difficulty. We recognize that you know, nobody can escape pain and struggle and trial, but, but we want as little of that as possible. Now again, we shouldn't go looking for it. <sighs> But listen, I want you to make sure you understand this. It is not God's will that we suffer and be miserable. But it is a fact that suffering and struggle are a part of human experience. 
that's a part of human experience in general and a part of Christian experience in particular. Think about this. Today we celebrate, we recognize Palm Sunday. What are we celebrating on Palm Sunday? Well, of course, it's the triumphal entry. But coming into the Passion Week, we look at the life of Christ, we fully acknowledge and understand that, that it was God's perfect plan that Jesus would come and suffer and die. Yeah, that was his purpose. But what about us? Does God's plan, God's perfect will for us, include suffering and pain? The problem is... While none of us who are mature expect life to always be easy, we expect it to almost always not be difficult. The key to handling and overcoming diversity in life is is not denying and avoiding it, but to face it head on and endure it and overcome it. I like this quote from C.S. Lewis. This is awesome. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. We can only overcome, we can only endure by God's power, of course. Now listen, some of you are are tuning in at home for the first time. You're like, man, (laughs) we're going to change the channel. (laughs) We're going to find a more happy preacher to listen to. I've been working on a joke. Maybe I'll do that next week. The only joke I could think of was not really appropriate for church, so Bill, I'll tell it to you after we go off the air here, okay? (laughs) It's not a dirty joke. It was just kind of borderline, okay? So those of you at home, too bad. Uh, I don't want this message to be a downer, though. I really do want to encourage. But sometimes the road to encouragement is that bitter pill, You know what I mean? Sometimes we've got to take our medicine. Listen, not all medicine is cherry flavored. Not all medicine is bubble gum flavored. Sometimes the bitter pill is the cure. I remember years ago, I heard somebody put it this way. Christians in America pray, Lord, lighten our load. Whereas Christians in other lands, especially in places like Sudan, Somalia, North Korea, Afghanistan, places where Christians face overt persecution, uh, physical danger, and even death. Instead of praying, Lord, lighten our load, they pray, Lord, strengthen our backs. We want a lighter load, but perhaps the Lord wants you to have a stronger back. Now, last week, we talked about real-life holiness. That is some real practical ways that we can be holy. If you'll take your Bible now, and we'll go to 1 Peter Reflect back on verses 11 and 12 in chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers, abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You know, we expect that we live holy lives, live as aliens and strangers, live as the Bible teaches that, well, what that means is we'll get favor in the world. I've even heard preachers preach this. You know, if you live according to God's will and God's plan for your life, then then you'll be blessed. And God certainly wants to bless us, but I, I do believe that our concept of blessing and God's concept of blessing are very, very different many, many times, if not all the time. Go with me back up to uh, hold First Peter, because we'll be back there. Back up to 2 Timothy. I'm going to read a passage there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, we think that if we live right, people will like us. If we live right, the world will bless us. But for any of us who live in the real world, you know, here on planet Earth, If we've been doing this any length of time, we know that that's just not so. This is what Paul says to Timothy, verse 1 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. He says, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. You know, there's one 
eschatological view. That's a view of the end times and the way history progresses and wraps up at the end. There's a, a, an old view that's not as popular anymore. It's, it's known as, as post-millennialism for those of you who are really into that kind of stuff. But post-millennialism basically teaches that the, the church is going to, to do a better and better job of making disciples of all nations and so on and so forth, that the world's just going to get better and better and better until finally, one person at a time, God takes over. Believe it or not, this was actually a very popular view. It could be very encouraging because the church is triumphant and marches on, but this is what the Bible actually says. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Christy, weren't we just talking about that earlier? Anyway, ungrateful, unholy, uh, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, that is, they're spiritual, but denying its power, that is, it doesn't affect their life. Boy, I'm glad this is the future, that our world isn't like this. Isn't that a terrible world to live in? This is the world we live in. And we're supposed to be be different. So what do we do? Well, God says you're holy. We're to be holy. We're to pursue holiness. Why? Well, bear this in mind. Holiness is sometimes hard. We want to believe, and if we define holiness in terms of just personal habits, you know, whatever we don't do or certain things that we do, you know, but, but I can be holy by myself, then that kind of holiness, while we may not be very good at it from time to time, it's not really that hard. I mean, quite frankly, un unless you're an alcoholic or some other kind of, of, uh, uh, of addict, it's not hard to not drink. It's not hard to not cuss, except Tim, I understand. You know, it's not... <laughs> It's not hard to not do certain bad things unless you've got some real serious addictive issues going on or maybe a, a biological predisposition. I understand that. Honestly, it's not hard to read your Bible. We understand this. It's not hard to read the Bible. It's not hard to pray. If we define holiness in terms of not sinning too bad and doing a few good things, then that's not really hard. But I want you to know, real life holiness is hard sometimes, maybe a lot of the time. All right, now let's read this passage in Second, excuse me, First Peter chapter two, starting at verse thirteen. Boy, this fits right in with what we're seeing in the news today. By the way, starting at verse thirteen, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men and women, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. Listen to this verse. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should admire and appreciate. That's not what it says, does it? That's not what it says. Christ suffered leaving you an example that you should be grateful for. That's true, but that's not what it says. He says, he left you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. You say, well, I don't deserve this. Well, what did Jesus deserve? He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. For you were all like sheep going astray, but now 
you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Well, yep. All right, here it comes. I skipped my rant, but I feel so compelled I want to share this. Perhaps you saw in the news about a a preacher down in Florida who got arrested for breaking their state's guidelines on gatherings. And some Christians will laud him as a hero for defying the state to have church. Listen, the, the state is not telling us not to have church. They're telling people not to gather in large crowds so that people don't get sick and die. But I want to tell you, I don't want to mention Rodney Howard Brown by name, (laughs) but this guy has been bad news for decades. This guy in my, never been accused of being humble opinion, is a crook and a liar. And some of you are watching this and you're like, but I like Rodney Howard Brown. I'm sorry that you like Rodney Howard Brown. Listen, this guy has fancied himself. You know what he calls himself? The Holy Ghost bartender. Because he goes around and gets people all drunk in the spirit. and People are stumbling. Listen, this is not what the Bible teaches. And on top of, let's just, let's, let's, okay, I'm going to try really hard here. Let's say that Rodney Howard Brown really was sincere and just felt compelled to gather together God's people to pray. And, and, and I get that. I sort, I sort of admired that concept. But listen, when challenged on breaking the, the state's order, one of the things that he had shared is we have, we have installed these machines that they spot the coronavirus in the air and zap it and kill it before it gets to you. Listen, that's a flat-out lie. So listen, if you still like Rodney Howard Brown, you're liking a liar. I might not always get it right, but I'm not going to lie to you. And then his buddy, Jonathan Shuttlesworth, who pastors a large church outside of Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah, he wants to have a big gathering, too. There are some people who say, hey, you know what? We're just demonstrating that we have faith. And think of people in the Bible who had faith. I got news for you. Daniel did not say, hey, I think I'll go get in the lion's den today. It was not his desire to be in the lion's den. He didn't go looking for a lion's den to climb into. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't say, hey, it's feeling a little cool outside. Let's go jump in the furnace. There's a difference between having faith in God and testing God. I remember I've shared with you this story before. When I was in college, where I went to college, actually it happened a couple years before I got there. But we had a relatively small building, a three-story high building. And there was a guy at the college who was absolutely convinced that God would protect him. He jumped off the roof. Because God would protect him. God kept him alive with two broken legs. How can I put this gently? Don't be an idiot. Okay? All right. I I better get back to the text. You know how I feel. I I, I just... Okay. Enough. You got it. Did I overdo it, dear? Are we going to have to have a talk when we get home? (laughs) (sighs) Hope you're feeling me. Here's what I want you to see in this passage that we just read in 1 Peter chapter 2. There are three principles of holy living. Now, unlike last week, last week verses 1 to 12 only had one imperative, only one direct command that is absolutely essential to holiness, and that one direct command is that we crave, that we desire to grow spiritually. That's where it all begins. I mean, if you don't want to grow spiritually, nothing can happen that can make that happen. You've got to have a desire. To grow spiritually. In the passage that we just read, if you hearken back to our grammar lesson that we had last week, in the passage that we just read, there's actually four imperatives and they all come in one verse. But we'll, we'll, I'll tell you what those are, uh, give you the big reveal at the end of the message, because that's not what we're going to focus today. There's four direct commands. One of them is actually a, a, an heiress command, and that means something special. I'll explain it a little bit later. But broader than that, in this passage that we just read, there are three principles of holy living. And I want you to know, these three principles are absolutely contrary to conventional wisdom. What you are about to hear as we reflect on this passage that I just read is absolutely contrasted with the ways of the world. But we've read it here in the Word, and we're going to talk about it. How can we, in real practical senses, 
live holy lives. Here's the first principle. You ready? Respect is, get it, given, not earned. That is absolutely backwards from what the world says. The world will tell you that respect is earned, not given. Now, in a sense, respect should be earned. Think back to verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that they respect you. I guess we could say it that way. There's a sense where earning respect is certainly correct. There's, there's a tr- an element of truth in that. But look at the passage that we read here. Verse 13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority. Now listen, this is the same Peter who in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 Uh, was challenged by the leaders, challenged by their governors and authorities and whatever in those days, was told specifically, stop preaching. And Peter said famously, Acts 4.29, excuse me, 4.19 and 5.29, Peter said famously, judge for yourselves. Should we obey God or man? We cannot stop doing what we have been doing because we are doing what God has commanded us to do. And so some of those preachers out there that are still defying state's orders on large gatherings and things like that, perhaps they have a genuine conviction and and that's the verse they're standing on. But the same Peter who said that, because they they didn't say, hey, don't gather, what they said is stop preaching the gospel. Stop talking about Jesus. Peter said, we can't do that. that. That's why we exist. That's what we're here for. The same Peter who said that is the one who said, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority. Let me ask you this question. Although there are some Christians out there who I'm sure were encouraged uh, and saw these preachers that I mentioned by name earlier as heroes, think about lost people, the people we're trying to reach. Are any of your non-Christian friends, neighbors, co-workers, colleagues, fellow students, and things like that saying, man, that's the kind of person I want to be friends with? It's not working, folks. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority. In a sense, respect can and should be earned. But for us Christians, specifically when relating to those in authority who are not commanding us something directly contrary to the Word of God, we are to show proper respect, period. That, by the way, is that aorist imperative. What does that mean? An aorist imperative. This is, this is a grammatical term. I want to share with you what it means. It means it's a once and for all. The principle of showing proper respect is a once for all principle. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptional times for being disrespectful. Once and for all. Listen, respect is not based on the character or competence of the official. Also, understand this. Showing such respect may not necessarily gain you favor. As Christians, we are to show respect, first of all, because it's the right thing to do, and second of all, because we have a higher purpose. Look again at verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. This is a really cool word here, by the way. The the word that's translated silence is a very specific word. It means literally to muzzle. Anybody's Bible translation have the word muzzle in there? Yeah, because it doesn't doesn't flow right into the the concept. We, We have a hard time understanding that. Anybody ever seen a muzzle in use? You know how muzzles work? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, bite him. Here's what a muzzle does. It keeps the dog from biting you. It does not keep the dog from barking. This is an analogy. You follow me? A muzzle keeps the dog from biting you. It doesn't keep the dog from barking. Listen, by submitting to authorities, by showing proper respect, it may not gain us favor. The state, the authorities, those people, uh, whoever they might be, wherever they might be, they they may not necessarily say nice things about us even. They might even continue to say bad things about us, but we've taken away the bite because there's nothing that they can can prosecute. There's nothing they can point a finger to and say, well, that's just wrong. So we, we show proper respect as Christians, first, because it's the right thing to do, and second, because we have that higher purpose. 
Let me ask you this question. Do people have to agree with your political views in order to be a Christian? We know the answer to that. Of course not. Really? Now listen, i got to tell you, this is, it's not as cut and dry as this. It's not as simple as this. Because there are, there are some political views out there that, quite frankly, I have a hard time balancing them with Scripture. You know what I mean? That, that's, it's like, I don't understand how you can support that or support a party that supports that. But at the same time, it, it, it's, it's complicated. But sometimes the truth is many Christians out there put our politics ahead of our faith. Uh, how, why would I say that? Well, what do you talk about more? What do you talk about more with strangers? What do you talk about more with, with people that you, know, you, you share regular conversation with? We act like politics is more important than our faith. But that's not true. This is an easy principle, by the way, as long as we like or voted for the particular leader. You know, I see a lot of Christians out there who say, you know, those people shouldn't be picking on the president. Okay, did you say that with the last president? Oh, no, that's because you were those people that were picking on the president. Now, this doesn't justify what those people are doing. But what I'm saying is, look, we've got to be consistent. We've got to show proper respect, whether the person deserves it or not, because respect is given, not earned. That is, if we want to live holy lives. Second, that was hard enough. Maybe we should just close in prayer. No, not going to do that, because I got more. This is contrary to conventional wisdom. Most people think that they have a job for their own personal benefit. Listen, the purpose of an employee should be the success of the employer. You're like, where in the world did you get that out of the Bible? I just read it. It's just it used words like slaves. Submit yourselves to your masters. Now, I do need to point out a couple of things. The Bible does not condone slavery. In fact, the Bible encourages us specifically to gain, if we are slaves, to gain our freedom if we can. So the Bible regulates slavery. It takes an existing situation in the world and regulates it. Same thing with polygamy, by the way. If you read the history of polygamy in the Bible, people will say, well, look at these people. They all had you know, multiple wives, which I have hard enough time with just one. I don't understand why anybody would want more than one. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you look at how polygamy entered humankind, it entered as sin. It was corruption of God's plan. I've shared with you before, I had a, a professor in college who was a missionary in Ethiopia. And at that time, when they went into Ethiopia, it was a predominantly Muslim country. And Muslim law, by the way, allows you to have four wives. You're limited to four. I don't know how they came up with that magic number. But uh, so there's a magic number out there, I guess. So you're limited to four. So they would go and convert these people to Christ, usually starting with the chief. And of course, the chief had his four wives. So what what are you supposed to do with those four wives that are dependent on you? Would you pick one and kick the other three out? And so they realized that they needed to modify. Now, they encouraged the chief or whoever to pick one as the wife, but still had to be responsible for the other three. That's a rule. Hey, here's the way to treat your wives or, or whatever the case may be. Christianity doesn't condone slavery, but it, it does regulate it. But also in this particular context, Peter uses a specific word. It's the word house slaves. Uh, it, it means more like an employee, uh, an employee of the household. Now, to be fair, in the first century, and many of Peter's readers probably fit into this category, in the first century there was a brutal form of slavery that existed. Slaves were like slavery in the 19th century United States, were seen as subhuman. They had no rights whatsoever. We're missing the beauty of this passage if we get hung up on slavery. What we should notice in this passage is that Peter even talks to slaves who in society, the worst kind of slaves, were deemed subhuman. But Paul reminds us in Galatians 3 that there's neither slave nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. 
you thought that being created equal was the invention of Thomas Jefferson. No, that, that comes from Jesus. Uh, according to the world, if your boss or your job sucks, you should quit. Please don't quit. You know, if, you should look for something better. And, and again, not to oversimplify it, there's a time to change jobs. I, I totally acknowledge that. But I will say, and I think this is a good contrast with the world, far too many people in this world, including far too many Christians, change jobs way too easily or quit jobs way too easily. Colossians 3, I love this passage, says, whatever you do, do it as to the Lord. Who's your boss? It's not the guy who signed your paycheck or the, the woman who signed your paycheck or the machine that signed your paycheck or whoever does that direct deposit. You know what I'm saying? Who you work for, Christian, is Jesus. He's the boss. Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16, it's where Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I want you to think about this. Let's imagine that you're in a difficult job position. We've all been there. I've had some pretty unpleasant jobs in my life. But consider this. Your boss, he, she, they're a tyrant. They're an idiot. Oh my gosh, I can't believe. If you met my boss, what would happen if your boss were converted? <laughs> Bite him. <laughs> Seriously. That, that horrible, ungodly boss. What would happen if he were or she were converted? Consider this. What attitude or what effect does your attitude have on your coworkers? You know, if it's, if it's bad with salt and light, how bad would it be without salt and light? Think about this. If you are to move on, and maybe God is calling you to a different position, a different job, a different company, whatever. But if you are to move on, who would take your place? You know, the, the truth is, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying there. Any employee, and for that matter, employer, can be replaced. You can fill a slot. Some jobs could be filled, I suppose, by a well-trained pony. You know what I mean? A well-groomed monkey. But do you see your position in the world, your place at work, at school, that place that you have to go to that you're not allowed to go to right now, do you see that as, as a place of drudgery or a place where you're a missionary? A place that perhaps God has called you. Understand this. The principle taught here is for those of us in the employ of others, it is our purpose to make them successful. Whether they're competent or deserve it or not is beside the point. It then becomes about you. I, you can't read the words on this uh, cartoon up here. I want to read it for you. It says, Dan, you are my most valuable employee. Your ineptitude consistently raises the self-esteem of everyone you work with. Everybody's got a purpose for, for why they are where God has them. There's a third principle. Let's go on. This is the one I was promising you. Hey, you know what? Christians are supposed to actually be like Jesus. I want you to go to verse 21. We read this verse, but I want you to see that th there is a beautiful word in this verse. Verse 21, 1 Peter chapter 2 says this, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. That word example. This word, it, it's the word hupagraman. Oh, that didn't mean anything to you. I'm going to explain it to you in just a second. First know this, it's the only place in the Bible you find this word. What this word means, the common usage in Greek in that day was this was a, a template that when you would teach children how to write, they would trace the letters. That's what the word example means. We're not just to look to Jesus and say, man, I need to be a little bit more like Jesus. We're supposed to be exactly like Jesus. 
We're supposed to follow his pattern exactly as he laid out the footsteps. We're supposed to follow in his steps. The idea of following in these steps is, you remember when it used to snow here? You know, and, you, and you'd go out, especially if you got the kids with you, you'd go out and you'd find the path and, and walk along, and then they'd follow right in your exact footsteps because they knew that's where it was safe and that's where they needed to be, and that's what this is saying. Follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It's not saying be a little bit like Jesus. It's saying be exactly like Jesus. Philippians 2 verse 5 says this, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. It doesn't say your attitude should be like Jesus a little bit once in a while, especially at church. Let me ask you a question. Do you trust God? Don't answer out loud because, of course, we all do, right? Really? Look back at the text. Verse 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When they cut him off in traffic, he didn't honk. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Do you trust God that much? Do you trust God enough to be totally contrary to what the... Do you trust God enough to give respect that is not earned? Do you trust God enough to, to put your boss's success ahead of yours? Do you trust God enough to change attitudes and actions in your life to conform to the example, the exact pattern of Jesus? Let me wrap it up here. Holiness really is demonstrated in one word. I want you to go back in the text. I'm going to show you, I told you there were four imperatives, and they're all found in verse 17. Show proper respect to everyone. That's the aorist imperative. He says basically this. Here's the rule. You must, once and for all, show proper respect to everyone. Period. But they doesn't matter. Show proper respect to everyone. Period. And then here's the other imperatives. Well, what does everyone mean? Well, it tells you. Love the brotherhood of believers. There's an imperative. Loving one another in the body of Christ is not optional, and it's not simply sentimental. We need to actively look for ways to express love to one another, more than just saying, I love you, and giving people hugs. Hugs are great. I can hardly wait till we can do that again. <laughs> Some of us are doing it anyway. I know, I'm a rebel. <sighs> but love, this is an imperative. It's not, hey, some, you, guys, you guys that are good at it over there, you love. No, love the brotherhood. What's the next imperative? Fear God. Worship, honor God. Worshiping God is not something that's optional. And finally, honor the king. Whoever those rulers are, give that proper respect. Holiness is demonstrated in one word, respect. Now, I love this quote from Oswald Chambers, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. I would say it a little differently. He says, no healthy Christian. I say, no Christian in their right mind. No healthy Christian ever chooses suffering. You should not go out saying, all right, I understand suffering is what God has called me to, so how can I suffer some more today? You know, there, there was a, a movement, there's still some people who do this, uh, monasticism throughout the Middle Ages, people would deprive themselves and, and flagellate themselves, literally, to suffer for Christ. That is not suffering for Christ, that's suffering, that's just nuts. You shouldn't go out and wake up every day and say, how can I suffer today? No healthy Christian ever chooses suffering, he chooses God's will, as Jesus did whether it means suffering or not. We want to do what God has called us to do, period. I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus. Everybody here in the room, I'm pretty sure you guys are essential. Anybody watching out there, let me, let me sum it up for you. The world's messed up. The world's messed up because people are in it. The world's messed up because people are in it because people are messed up. We're all people. 
We're all just sinners that need a Savior, and Jesus is the only one that's qualified. So if you've never acknowledged your need for a Savior, maybe today's the day you say, you know what, whatever goes on in the world, I'm just a sinner that needs a Savior. And for the rest of us who have made that decision however long ago in our life, isn't that kind of cool? This, this is how we roll with the punches. And there are people out there who are freaking out. I don't know why people have 500 rolls of toilet paper. But you know what? There are people out there that aren't freaking out, and that's because they know that God is with them. They're walking with Jesus. Let's stand together. We'll pray. Father, that we might understand your will in these times, that we might understand your will at all times. Lord, speak to our hearts and to our souls. Help us to, to understand. Lord, if there's anybody here, wherever here might be, who has never made a decision to be a follower of Jesus, let today be the day that they realize and recognize and respond to the fact that we're all just sinners that need a Savior, and that includes them, and they're ready to make that decision right now to say, you know what, count me in. I need to be a follower of Jesus. Turn from a life of sin. Accept this following of Jesus that is so contrary to the world. Lord, for the rest of us, challenge us. Convict us with your spirit and use us to be the salt and light that you say we are in Jesus' name.